Welcome, everyone. Welcome to our 50th wedding anniversary. <laughs> right. Welcome to our 50th anniversary of the department. I want to thank all of you, our alumni, our friends, former employees, also current faculty, staff, and students, all of you for coming today to this great facility to celebrate, uh, to celebrate the many accomplishments by our department over the many, many years. I'd like to start by reading from the motion approved by the Ohio State Faculty Council on Valentine's Day, 1967. The motion read that as of July 1, 1967, plant pathology, which is now part of the Department of Botany and Plant Pathology in the College of Biological Sciences, be established as the Department of Plant Pathology with responsibilities of resident instruction, research, and extension in the College of Agriculture and Home Economics. So today, July 1st, is the perfect day to be celebrating, to celebrating our birthday. 50 years is a long time, of course, and many of you were not even born when our department was founded. So let me tell you just about a few things that were happening in the world in 1967. The Vietnam War was raging, and President Lyndon Johnson, despite many controversies, was Time Magazine Man of the Year. This was long before they had Person of the Year. McDonald's introduced the Big Mac. The first, the first handheld cal calculator was invented by Texas Instrument, although I couldn't use it through my undergraduate days because it was, um, gave, gave me an unfair advantage because these things were too expensive. The first ATM machine was introduced in London. The Beatles, Rolling Stones, and even the Monkees were the top musical groups of the year. Disney's Jungle Book movie was one of the top movies of the year. The Green Bay, the Green Bay Packers won the very first Super Bowl ever played. Jack Nicklaus won the US Open in golf. And for, and for you um, uh, hockey fans, the Toronto Maple Leafs won the Stanley Cup. The Buckeyes in football only went six and three that year, but they did handily beat Michigan, so all was well. <laughs> and to our benefit, plant pathology became a standalone department after contributions by plant pathologists going back to almost the very beginnings of the university and the experiment station. The first course in plant pathology at Ohio State was taught in Columbus in 1891, and major sustained research on plant diseases started when Selby was hired at the experiment station in Worcester in 1894. Over many, many decades, plant pathology had various and changing homes within the university and experiment station, both in Columbus and Worcester. Then in 1948, plant pathologists were put into a single academic department, botany and plant pathology, but Worcester and Columbus operations did remain pretty much separate. And, and, and not only separate, separate budgets, and there was little mixing of research, teaching, and extension. The splitting of agriculture and biological sciences into two colleges precipitated the formation of our, of our department 50 years ago. But don't get the impression this was an easy or automatic thing that happened. Many of the early plant pathologists in the department worked very long over multiple years with multiple proposals before this was finally approved. Although there were clearly very important research, teaching, and extension, and also important international development work going on over many decades at Ohio State, starting in the late 1800s, things really did uh, take off when the department became a standalone unit in 1967. At its birth, the department had only 14 faculty members and only six grad students. And actually, of those 14 faculty, three left shortly after that due to retirements or another job offer. However, by 1975, just a few years later, there were 25 faculty members in the department, going from 14 down to 11 up to 25, including two ARS scientists, and there were 17 or more grad students consistently from that point on. Budget cuts over the last three decades um, lower those numbers in terms of faculty, um, where we lost various individuals, but you know, we have currently about 15 faculty members and another two ARS adjunct faculty members. And we have now, over the last two years, 40 graduate students, basically one of the highest 
graduate, largest graduate programs in plant pathology in the country. Plus, recently we created, thanks to Andorans and others, a professional master's degree in plant health management due to industry demand. This is a non-thesis non degree, and we have over 20 students in that program, and the number of applications are exploding there. Undergraduate enrollment in our department has gone up and down over many, many decades with very small numbers and high and back and forth. Right now, we have 25 undergraduates or so in our, you know, undergraduates in our department, which I would argue might be the highest in the country, plant pathology being primarily a graduate degree. Although plant pathologists at Ohio or in Ohio have had a strong local impact for over 125 years, the new department moved to a very high level, a new and high level of consistent national and international impact in leadership. The statistics show that in many ways. Six presidents of APS, presidents of other professional societies, numerous council members of APS, journal editorships, including editors-in-chief, countless awards like elected fellow and so on, many, many successful graduates, groundbreaking research from genomics and molecular biology to epidemiology and disease management, research and capacity building around the world, and innovative classroom and extension teaching. Those faculty members in 1967 who worked so hard to get this department as a standalone unit really were right that, 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 we, that plant pathology would do well with a separate department. A lot has changed in our, in our department over the last 50 years. For, for you old timers out there, I just want to let you know that grants and contracts are used to fund virtually everything in the department. Uh, university money is mostly to pay for faculty salaries. Everything else we, we primarily raise from grants. We do our library work from our offices. There are no secretaries. Everyone types and types and types all the time. We but we still rely greatly on wonderful office personnel in human resources and fiscal. Most mail is email, and we Skype instead of phoning a lot of the time. We teach most of our courses completely or almost completely by video link between the two campuses. Most meetings are also done by video link. Some courses are taught only online, and the list goes on and on. Let me conclude before I introduce the other speakers with some statistics to put the, the evolution of our department into perspective. In 1890, about the time the first course in plant pathology was taught here, 46% of the U.S. population lived on a farm. That means half of the U.S. had to produce the food for the other half of the country. When our department was formed in 67, 5% lived on a farm, and today 2% live on a farm. And that 2% feeds the U.S. and many parts of the world. I think we can take great pride that we contributed as a department and as a profession and a discipline to the increase in productivity throughout the United States and parts of the world. We did that through improved disease control. But we definitely cannot rest on our laurels as a department or as a profession. Today, there are 7.5 billion people on the planet, and there will be 9.7 billion by 2050. We will need to increase food production globally by 70 to 100 percent to meet the demands. And we need to do that in an environmentally friendly and a sustainable way. This can only be done by the work of plant pathologists working with other agricultural and environmental scientists. So there's a lot of work for our department to do in the next 50 years when we celebrate our 100th anniversary. With, that futuring, with those futuring comments, I want to move back to some more historical comments and introduce a person that I met when I joined the department in 1980. He was one of that large cohort of new faculty members hired in 67 to the early 70s, and that's Randy Rowe. He ultimately became president of APS and ultimately served as associate chair and then chair of our department. And as I think you all know in this room, just hot off the presses, finished the new edition of our history book. So Randy is going to give us a few comments uh, 
few historical comments about our department. Randy? There's a pointer on that, a laser pointer, if you want it. I don't know where it is. Uh, probably the front one. I don't know. OK, you don't need it. Just I need to advance the slide. OK, you need to stand pretty close to it. OK, we're going over the technical things here. <laughs> Well, it's my pleasure to be here and to speak to you. Uh, this Department of Plant Pathology has uh, been a very, very important thing in, in my life. And it's interesting as I think, uh, Larry talked about 1967 being an important year for a lot of things. And uh, for me personally, two things happened in 1967 only a week apart that have affected all of my life. Uh, the first, first one was that I married my wife a week before this department was founded. Was so, right way, but he didn't even mention that. <laughs> so we celebrated our 50th anniversary just a week ago, and now we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Department of Plant Pathology. <laughs> at, at that time, I didn't know anything about the Department of Plant Pathology being founded here, but I was just, I was an undergraduate at Michigan State, had just graduated, and had just decided to go to, uh, into graduate work in plant pathology at Oregon State University. And while I was there, uh, there was a professor in the department there who I really didn't know, but heard his name, his name was Ira Deep. And uh, I was really enjoying Oregon very much as a novel experience for a, guy, a young guy from Detroit. And I had heard that this Ira Deep guy was going to leave and, and go to Ohio to, be, uh, the, to join this department. And I remember thinking as an undergraduate, I mean, as a young graduate student, why would you leave this beautiful state of Oregon to go to Ohio? <laughs> Little did I know that about four years later or five years later, he would hire me. <laughs> So life is strange in that way. Well, anyway, I was very pleased about five years ago when Terry Wheeler, or Terry Wheeler, uh, Terry Niblack, uh, at the plant pathology meeting approached me and uh, asked if I would be interested in updating the, uh, the history book in, in plant pathology in our department. And the current history, which we refer to as the first edition, was written by Lansing Williams and by Wayne Ellett. And uh, they had done an outstanding job and had really researched a lot of the early history and all those sorts of things. And I had never thought about updating it at all, but I thought, hey, that sounds kind of interesting. I'm a person who has always been very interested in history. I read a lot of American history uh, in all kinds of aspects. And I believe very firmly that to, to really be a good leader and to really understand, be a good citizen and everything, you need to understand history. If you don't understand, there's an old saying that those who don't understand history are doomed to repeat it. And I think there's an awful lot of truth to that for a lot of things. But in the case of plant pathology, we had this history, and so I took on the task of, of updating it. Well, as soon as I got into that project, about first six or eight months or a year, I realized that there was a lot more that could be done than just, quote, updating it, and a complete revision was in, was in, in order. One of the things is that technology had changed in printing so much that at the time that one was written in the mid-90s, there were only 10 or a dozen pictures in there because it's very expensive to put pictures in publications. Now, they're digital. You can put all the pictures you want. It doesn't affect the price particularly. So that opened a whole new possibility. There are over 275 pictures in this book. And one of the real fun things was finding all these pictures. Well, what I want to do, and I hope that all of you get your copy of the book. We're, we're giving them out free uh, over next door, so if you didn't get one already, you can get one before you leave here, and I'll sign it if you'd like. Uh, one of the things that I want to do right here is to talk about the, the, early, the early history of our department and a celebration, so to speak, of our professional ancestors in the Department of Plant Pathology. We all have family ancestors. But those of us who are in a profession like plant pathology have professional ancestors as well. And those are very important to us. And so I want to talk to you just a little bit about some of those early ones, many of whom I personally really didn't know much before I got into this history project. But our history is 50 years old as a department, but as a discipline at this university, goes back over 100 years. 
almost 125 years. So it's a very rich history. Are you good? Fancy him or? Yeah. What is it? How do I do it? Which one? We're figuring out how to advance the pictures. That's it, right there. Okay. The first one I want to talk to you about is William Kellerman. Now, these pictures were in our original history book. And by the way, this history is considered the second edition. The original history, uh, first, is all in here. Virtually everything that's in that first history is in this book, almost verbatim. I edited it and reorganized the early chapters a little bit, but that's about it. So all that work is still here. And uh, there were some interesting things about uh, Dr. Kellerman there, but things that I didn't know as well. He was the chair of botany at the time and uh, came, let me sit over here where I can see a little bit. He came in 1891, works if I can see a little bit myself, <laughs> came in 1891. He was the person who taught the very first courses in plant pathology at Ohio State University. He's really the father of plant pathology at this university. And I don't think he was really being given credit for that. Very distinguished person. This picture here is in the book. I just love this picture. This is such a slice of life from 125 years ago. This is a picture of his class. You see the little blue arrow? That's Kellerman. And his class went out on a field trip to collect botanical specimens somewhere around Columbus. And they came back and took this group picture after they came back from the class. Now, I don't think any of us in any of our experiences has ever seen students dressed like this <laughs> to go out on a class field trip. But that's the way they dressed back then. Another thing that's interesting is, is, and I never even noticed this, somebody pointed out to me, look at that guy up in the upper right-hand corner, he's carrying a big knife. <laughs> well, they were showing off their tools, I guess, for harvesting plants, I don't know, but you wouldn't see that nowadays. But that's a wonderful slice of life picture. And, and there's Kellerman right in the middle of with all his students. This is a fantastic picture that Sally Miller found in a journal that was published. The other thing that Kellerman did that was very interesting, but un unfortunately it was his undoing, is that he got very interested in Guatemala and was going down to Guatemala uh, over in the winter time on collecting expeditions. He was a mycologist and he was collecting fungi. And this is a picture of Kellerman that was taken actually in 1908 on his fourth trip there. And he had gotten the idea and gotten the permission from Ohio State University to start a tropical school of botany in association with Ohio State University in Guatemala. It's the kind of thing we would think of doing maybe nowadays. But this was a hundred and some years ago. And he went down there on his last expedition and unfortunately came down with some jungle disease and died right in Guatemala. And they buried him there. He's still there as far as we know. <laughs> So it's a very unfortunate end to a very distinguished man. Another person that I want to tell you about is Frederica Detmers. Frederica Detmers is highlighted in this book as a pioneering woman in Ohio plant pathology. And she really was, and I don't think she has been given her due at all by this university or this department. Here's a woman who was a professional scientist 100 years ago. You've heard of all the problems of women in science and all this sort of thing. This is 100 years ago. Think how many problems she must have had back then. And she did, I know. She was a product of Ohio State University. She was actually a, uh, a, a, a Kellerman was actually her mentor and really encouraged her greatly. She got both her MS and PhD degrees here at OSU. She was on the faculty in Columbus for a period of years. And there was some sort of an issue that she ended up quitting her job. And then she went up to Worcester and got hired up there and was on the faculty there. So she was actually at both institutions. And then at the very end of her career, she went, which nobody knows why, she went out to California and became the herbarium curator at USC. Obviously a very distinguished woman. She was involved in a lot of professional organizations and things like that. I wanted to point out this picture again. There's her in this picture as well, where the blue arrow is there. And this is when she was still working closely with Kellerman before she was on the faculty. This picture of her actually was taken when she was president of the uh, Alumni Association at Ohio State University. She was the first 
she got the first master's degree from Ohio State University in a field related to plant pathology. Her, her master's thesis was on rust fungi. She was the first, this is very interesting, we dug this out. I don't think anybody knew that. She was actually the first PhD scientist in plant pathology that was on the faculty at Worcester. The first PhD scientist was a woman. She was the first Ohio woman to hold a position in botanical research, a full-time position in botanical research. So there's a whole, there's a special section in this book of listing her as a pioneering woman in Ohio science and, and plant pathology, and I hope that you'll look that over. Of course, we've all heard of Selby. Selby Hall is named after Selby. He was listed as the chief of the botany department of the Ohio Agricultural Experiment Station, and as Larry mentioned, that was a completely separate institution from Ohio State University at the time. He was the first plant pathologist on the Worcester campus, and uh, his career there was 20-some years, and uh, he became a very important part of the administrative staff. Uh, Thorne on the right was the, the director of the experiment station there. He was kind of the head honcho. And uh, Selby and some of these other were sort of his right-hand men. And the staff is in the back. That's, that was the entire staff of the whole Worcester Center at the time. Another thing, though, it's very important about Selby is his relationship to APS. He was a member of a small group of professionals across the country that came up with the idea of a separate association for plant pathology, and they together founded the American Phytopathological Society. And uh, he was the first vice president in 1908 when APS was founded, and he was the third president of the society. And those facts are really not very well re uh, remembered nationally, or maybe even locally. But Selby was a very distinguished person in that regard. The next person I want to talk to you about is a person whose name I had heard but really did not know very well, and that's Wilmer Stover. Wilmer Stover really was the backbone of the graduate department here in, at Ohio State University. This is I mean, the graduate program. This is before we were a separate department, but we had a plant pathology graduate program, and he was really the backbone of that program. He was on the faculty for 40 years, long period of time to serve. He taught plant pathology and mycology, but he was the primary founder of the graduate program in plant pathology well before the department was ever founded. This is a picture I love that, that shows him on the right-hand side there uh, out on the field, in a field trip with plant pathologist students and uh, in 1947, by then they learned to dress more reasonably for going out in the field, I guess. <laughs> they left the other, the Sunday clothes for back at home at that, at that day. But he does have his tie on, that's right. Yeah, I mean, even Lansing Williams, who was my boss for so many years, never, ever came to work without a tie on. So things, things changed. But this is a great picture. He was very closely involved with students. And uh, this is an interesting picture here, taken in 1948. Uh, some of these pictures were Wayne Ellett's. There was a there was a, a box of three or four uh, of, of three or four boxes of just assorted stuff that had that Wayne Ellett had. And I looked through there. There were all kinds of different pictures, and I found this picture in that in that group. But this is a picture. The the arrow is pointing to Stover, and this was just couple, three years before he retired, but the other arrow up above is C.C. Allison. So this is kind of when the baton was being handled, handed over from Stover to C.C. Allison for the graduate program. Now, C.C. Allison is a name that we are all still familiar with, primarily because of the C.C. Allison Award. And this is an award that is given to the outstanding graduate student every year but I'd be willing to bet that most of the graduate students had the clue who C.C. Allison was. Uh, C.C. Allison was a very distinguished member of the faculty in Columbus from 38 to 72. He was the primary leader of the graduate program between 46 and 64. And when I say primary leader, he was the graduate program. Now Lansing Williams, I'll talk to you about Lansing in just a minute, was, was my boss and my mentor when I was a young faculty member. He got his graduate degree here and I talked to him at length about C.C. Allison and he just revered C.C. Allison. And he always, his name was Clyde, but he never went by that. He went by C.C. That's what people called him, C.C., I guess. 
Anyway, he essentially advised all the graduate students, taught virtually all the courses. He was the graduate program. <laughs> this is a picture of C.C. Allison a little bit later, 1959. That's him standing with several graduate students there. Actually, that's Wayne Ellett there. He was actually on the faculty at that time. But this is an incredible statistic. He advised 45 PhD and 50 master's students. Now nobody is going to be even remotely close to that <laughs> anymore. But that's what he did. That was the main thing that he did. He was revered by the graduate students, partly revered, partly feared, I think. But uh, they thought very highly of him. He, he interacted closely with the graduate students and was a very important part of, of the program. And that's how the award got started. It was after his retirement. He contributed a significant amount of money, and other people did at the time to get that started. Now, I want to talk to you about three people also who were in graduate school all at the same time in the department, Wayne Ellett, Lansing Williams, and Fritz Schmidhenner. They were all graduate students together in the Department of Plant Pathology. Wayne, that shows you when he got his degrees there. He was on the faculty from 46 to 81. He taught botany, plant pathology, mycology, did a lot of teaching. This <clears throat> significant thing about Wayne's career is that the last 10 years of his career, he was the first director of the plant disease clinic. The clinic was started at that time, and he took the directorship of it for the first 10 years. Wayne was very much interested and loved mushrooms. And he went, uh, one of the things he did on the side is kind of went around the state talking, giving his talk on the wonderful world of mushrooms. He was kind of a mushroom guy. Fritz Schmidhenner, who is with us today, which is not too many of our ancestors here are with us today, but Fritz is with us today. He and I was sitting at his table. Fritz is 91 years old right now and still very active guy. And I've known Fritz my entire career, wonderful guy. He was one of the three that got their degrees at about the same time and ended up on the faculty here. He was the first soybean pathologist in the department, and he did pioneering work on Phytophthora root rot. Here's a picture of Fritz and Lansing Williams together out in a soybean field. I don't know what he's telling Lansing, but probably something about Phytophthora. He led research on Phytophthora for about 40 years, and he advised a lot of people as well, nine masters and 15 PhD students to their degrees. So he had a very distinguished career. I realized when I was writing this book that Fritz and Lansing was still living at the time, were the two oldest people with any kind of corporate memory for the department, going with their, their personal memories going all the way back to the late 40s. <clears throat> and one of the things I did was I conducted a, a oral history with both of them and there are excerpts from that oral history in this book that give a real slice of what life was like as a graduate student and as a young faculty member in the late 40s and the early 50s. Lansing, as I said, was, was one of my mentors when I was a young faculty member. He and Ira actually hired me, which was a great decision on their part, but a wonderful decision <laughs> for me because it gave me a career that I it was just a wonderful career. I had spent my entire career in the department and uh, had a great time doing that. But Lansing was uh, here from 54 to 89, but he worked with Ira as the associate chair in Worcester during the first 20 years of the department's life. He got very involved in maize virus diseases in the 60s. There was a big epidemic all across the state at the time, and he got heavily involved in that which led to the development of the maize virus research group in 1966, which he spearheaded their development. And there's a special thing in the book that those of you who are interested in that should read. It was written, a lot of it is written by Skip Nault. And late, the later part, the more newer part, was written by Peg Redenbaugh. Ira, as we know, was the first chair of the department. He came from Oregon State University. He was lured here from Oregon State University, where he was a full professor. Why would he leave Oregon? I wondered that at the time. But anyway, he came here and did an outstanding job of organizing this department, which at the time was very, very primitively organized. And, and there was a lot, of, a lot of people at Worcester. There wasn't too many people here at Columbus. But Ira worked with Lansing, and together with they hired a whole bunch of faculty, and all of us worked hard to build the department 
to the stage it was when we passed it off to the rest of you, and you have done an outstanding job of bringing it to where it is today. Ira was an excellent teacher, spent a lot of his time teaching. He, he was, a, was involved in teaching directly all the years he was department chair and after before he retired. And even after he retired, he was involved several years in various aspects of teaching. So the thing I want to leave with you is that as we pursue our own careers, I always want you to remember that all of us stand on the shoulders of those who went before us. We don't do these things just on ourselves. We don't build a department like this just on ourselves. There are many people that came along and did various things, and we should all be very proud of what they have done and what all of you are doing now. Stand right here. To, uh, to thank Randy for the great work he did on the history book over the last five years, I guess, we prepared a, come up here, Randy. <laughs> you don't know about this. <laughs> you don't know, you do now. We prepared uh, a, framed, a framed version of the cover of the book, That's a great. reduced version with a plaque, uh, an inscription underneath. So I hope you find a spot for this in your office somewhere <laughs> or wherever seems to be appropriate. So we have that Thank for you. you. Thank and you. And not only that, not, not only that, we are well aware of your 50th anniversary, and this one cake that has a 50 on it, that is actually for you to take when you leave as, uh, to celebrate your 50th anniversary. Yeah, nice. No, 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 that's not for you. <laughs> that's not for you. So you can, don't forget to take that. All right. Okay. All right, thank you, Randy. The graduate program has always been very important to the department. We've de we depend on our students. We work hard to recruit good students. We work with them. They, they bring us along to the newest reaches of science. And, and it's, it's one of the, you know, the great, great accomplishments, great feelings of being in a department like this over the years, getting to know and to mentor graduate students. So I think it's very important that we hear a little bit from two of the students in our department right now. Rachel Capoya, who is the uh, current president of the, uh, our Graduate Student Association, and Karasai Mills, who was part of the organizi organizing committee for this event. So we're, I don't see, oh, there they are, okay. Okay, uh, hi everyone. Thanks so much for coming to celebrate our department's milestone anniversary. Uh, my name is Rachel. My name is Rachel Capoya, and I'm the current president of the Plant Pathology Graduate Student Association, or PPGSA, and this is Cara Sai Mills, and she's my vice president. Um, in 2011, the National Research Council ranked Ohio State Plant Pathology as the number one doctoral research program. And to anyone who has spent time with members of this department, that really should not be any surprise. Um, uh, currently, we have 60 students representing 15 different nationalities and an even greater number of diverse backgrounds. We are brought together by this amazing department that provides unparalleled support for its students. A big part of this includes ensuring funding so that students can work with a peace of mind that they're not at risk losing funding for their research along the way. This also includes encouraging students to attend scientific conferences such as APS by promoting a culture that allows students the time to attend these things. The faculty here consistently provides an excellent example of involvement and leadership through their work in the department, the school as a whole, and involvement in other professional organizations. Having such strong leaders to look up to has certainly provided inspiration for the students to participate in such involvement of their own. 21 years ago, the founding of the PPGSA was initiated by Bill Turchek to uh, facilitate interactions between students in the department allow for discourse about relevant issues, and help students become oriented and involved in the department. This organization has certainly succeeded in doing so. The PPGSA helps students navigate graduate school through regular meetings, um, programming designed for professional and personal development, and fun social activities like kayaking and go-karting. We sustain our activities through fundraising events like the annual plant sales in Columbus and Worcester, 
and things like the 50th anniversary merchandise available for you to purchase today. <laughs> And of course, the PPGSA gives back to the community with outreach opportunities, including volunteering at the Wayne County Fair, conducting plant disease nature walks and career days with local schools and camps, and electing representatives to serve on OSU's Council of Graduate Students. I'm gonna let Cara tell you a little bit more about our activities as a group. Thank you, Rachel. My name is Cara Sai Mills. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the relationship between PPGSA and the department together. So over the years, they've developed a very strong working relationship. The department has invited a student delegate on multiple faculty committees, like academic affairs, graduate studies, and the vision committee. And what this does is this enables students to have a voice as the department continues to develop into the future. We get to talk when positions are filled. We get to say when curricula changes and alters. And the department is very welcoming with these things. Overall, this department empowers its students. That is something that we see over and over again. They are unwaveringly supportive in good times and in hard times. They foster a sense of community we have events, we have retreats, we do holiday activities. It feels like a family. And also, they're incredibly generous. Uh, one PPGSA gives student travel awards that students can afford to go to meetings. The department matches the funds, and that makes a huge difference in how many students can go and attend these scientific societies. So on behalf of PPGSA, previous generations of students, I want to genuinely thank the department. I want to thank you for the generosity for the respect, and for the friendship that you offer to us. Thank you. Thank, uh, thanks for those wonderful comments. And as, as the students indicated, buy, buy stuff from them if you haven't already done it. The money goes to their organization, not to the department. Also, make sure you get a copy of Randy's book if you don't have it already. Our next speaker is Terry Niblack. Terry um, was hired from University of Illinois six years ago, basically, to be the, uh, the chair of the department. For the last year and a half, she's been on assignment in the dean's office as interim senior associate dean. And she's going to make just a couple of comments related to senior administration and comment relevant for our students. Somebody left their keys up here. Yeah, they've, they've been there oh, all okay. <laughs> I am uh, Terry Niblack. I'm currently the acting senior associate dean for the college, as Larry said. And Larry is now serving his third term as acting or interim chair of the department. <laughs> for which we thank him very much. It was, uh, it was something that really required someone with outstanding leadership skills and the respect of the entire department to step in and do for all this time. So thank you, Larry. I'm here for two purposes. The first purpose is um, speaking on behalf of the college because our dean, uh, Kath Ann Kress, couldn't be here with us today, but she was very excited about being asked to come and so she asked me to bring some messages from the college, and I'm going to do that very quickly. I hope not too quickly. Heartfelt. Um, so I want to, from Kath Ann and the rest of the administrative cabinet, bring you congratulations and the very best anniversary wishes. Um, she wasn't able to be here today, but she does send her heartfelt congratulations as one of the most productive, interconnected, and highly ranked departments in our college, the Department of Plant Pathology brings us, as a college, superior standing at the university and among land-grant institutions, as you've heard. Dr. Kress also asked me to thank you for the dedication that you demonstrate every day to your discipline and to the land-grant mission and the many brilliant achievements that you've made in support of our citizens and around the globe. These are excellent reflections of the college, so it's a little self-serving here, <laughs> as well as being matters of personal importance to every one of us. The college is 
immeasurably proud to be home to this department. Happy birthday. So my second purpose for uh, speaking to you today is to announce the establishment of a new endowment in the Department of Plant Pathology. As you've just heard the two wonderful speakers, graduate students, Rachel and Kara, graduate students are, are our most important resource and their training is our most important product. That training, the production of graduate students, is a tangible expression of hope for the future and optimism about the future. We have exceptional alumni. I've met many alumni that are here today. We have outstanding current students. We put a lot of effort into recruiting exceptional students. And the purpose of this new endowment is to support increased opportunities for professional development for future graduate students in our department. So today is the public unveiling of the new endowment, which has been approved by the Board of Trustees to be named in honor of the first chair and associate chair of the Department of Plant Pathology. You all know the names now. Dr. Ira Deep and Dr. Lansing Williams, who is sadly no longer with us. So I want to I want to go a little bit further. The we had a silent phase of fundraising for this endowment uh, for the past uh, few months among the the former chairs and associate chairs of the department. An endowment requires a principal balance of fifty thousand dollars. In the silent phase, we have raised thirty two thousand five hundred dollars already. So we're only a few dollars short of having the required $50,000. So if you, I'm sorry, I gotta do this. <laughs> I'm not selling t-shirts, but if you, like I do, believe strongly in the education and training of plant pathologists at the graduate level, please consider making a donation to this fund. I know we all have well-established philanthropic, pri philanthropic priorities. I do, too, you know, but this is extremely important to me, and I think it's important to a lot of you as well. So please uh, in, join me again in thanking Dr. Deep and his late colleague, Dr. Williams, for their foresight in the establishment of this wonderful department. Thank you. Okay, I forgot one thing. We have forms here for making a donation. Sarah has some of them and she can pass them out to you and the, the rest of them, if you'd like to pick one up, will be on the piano out the double doors back there. Thanks. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you, Terry. Our next speaker, our final speaker, is Ira Deep, the first chair of the Department of Plant Pathology at Ohio State University. You already know his history and his background, thanks to Randy and, and thanks to the book, if you read that, and thanks to everything else. Ira was chair when I was hired as a faculty member, and I got to know Ira really well over the years, so I'm really pleased that he could speak to us for a few minutes today. Ira. Thank you, Larry. Uh, <clears throat> Terry didn't indicate this, but uh, Terry was the one who recommended that we set up this endowment uh, to provide some funds that could be used by the chairman to do some things that the chairman thought needed to be done uh, in the department. And uh, as a department chairman for a number of years, I found many times when I had wished that we would have uh, such fun. So I, congratulations to Terry also, that's, that's really great. Uh, and thank you, uh, all of you who made the decision about naming this fund for me and Lansing. And uh, I do appreciate that. 
Uh, I want to start out uh, by just introducing uh, my family who are here, Marie Garraway, and uh, my two sons, Brian and Craig, and Brian's wife, Terry. Uh, I'm happy to have them here today. Uh, I'm going to start out talking about some things about myself personally that uh, you will wonder what this has to do with my becoming uh, chairman of the plant pathology department. But uh, I think it'll tie in in two or three minutes. Uh, I grew up in Middletown, Ohio. I, I loved it in Middletown. Uh, I graduated from uh, Middletown High School in 1945. 45, war with Japan is still on. Uh, 7,000 Marines died at Iwo Jima in February 1945. So, like many others, graduated from high school, I went down and joined the Marine Corps. And uh, all of us thought we were gonna charge the beaches of Japan uh, and, and many people would die. Well, it didn't happen that way. Many people did die, and it's an unfortunate thing. All of us regret the fact that the atomic bombs were dropped on Japan, and now we're looking back on it, and you always wonder uh, what the alternative might have been, but uh, that's, that's the way it happened. The war ended, and, uh, you know, I start out talking about this uh, because I came, I came up from a, a family that worked in the mills, worked on small farms, didn't have any money. Uh, no one went to college. No one thought about going to college. Most of the people in my family didn't graduate from high school. They were doing other things. It was, it was just that time of life. Fortunately, after 50, after more than that, 70 years, um, all of the kids go to college, and it's, it's just a different world. Uh, but at any rate, that's one reason why I would not have been selected as the first chairman. But I did go to college. I had the GI Bill. The GI Bill was a wonderful thing, and uh, it benefited so many people. And it changed society because people like me who never would have gone to college did go to college and became professors or doctors or whatever. And it, and it changed uh, so many things. Anyway, I went to Miami University for four years. That's Oxford, Ohio. Um, I went, in 1950, I went to University of Tennessee to work on a master's degree. I met uh, Elsie Onifer. And uh, we got married in 52. Both of us had our master's degrees in botany. And uh, uh, you, you know, they, they joke about women going to college to get their missus degree. Well, men did the same thing. You know, that's where you, that's where you found your wives. Uh, anyway, I got my, uh, we went on to Oregon State to work on a PhD degree. I got the PhD degree in 56 and um, stayed on the faculty. Many times that happened in the 1950s. Um, so we stayed on the faculty. By 1966, we had four sons and a daughter, and I had an opportunity to, to go to Washington, D.C. Uh, to work with QEBS. That's the Commission on Undergraduate Education in the Biological Sciences. Uh, there were many of those. Uh, kinds of or, or organizations. And um, so Elsie and I piled the five kids into the old Chevy. We drive to Washington. Uh, we spend the year. We drive, put the kids in the Chevy, drive back. And uh, so it's 1967, September. I get a call from Dean Roy Cotman. Uh, uh, Dean Roy Cotman. Well, Ira, would you like to come to Ohio State and interview 
for the position as chairman of the plant pathology department. Uh, in the first place, I had never, <laughs> I had not in, uh, applied for the position. Uh, but I did meet the dean in Washington. He was a commissioner for QEBS. Uh, I don't know that the dean knew me that well, but uh, obviously he knew I was a plant pathologist. And obviously what happened was uh, he recommended to the committee, and Lansing Williams was chairman of the committee, he recommended to the committee that uh, they, they interview me, and the committee was willing to do this. So, so I got the job. <laughs> surprise, <laughs> surprise. Uh, and anyway, uh, I, I did get the job, and uh, I am the uh, first chairman of the plant pathology department. Um, what was the department like at that time? Well, it's, it's kind of nice that uh, Larry and Randy have talked about this because particularly the things that Randy says, you know a lot about what the department was like. Um, the, the dean had changed the name of the experiment station to the OARDC, but it was the experiment station. It had been there forever, and it had been active, it had been productive uh, for many, many years. And, uh, uh, you know, L.J. Alexander, Lansing Williams, uh, Kurt Laban, uh, Fritz Schmidhenner, uh, Lynn Herr, and um, uh, young faculty members like Don Gordon and Ray Louie, and a really young one like Harry Hoytink, who had only been there a year. But anyway, they, they had a solid program. Well, what about at Ohio State? Well, Randy went through this very well. At Ohio State, in the 1950s and early 60s, was very effective. In fact, three uh, of, of our faculty members at Worcester, uh, Lansing Williams, Fritz schmidt um uh, Lynn Herr, all got their PhD degrees at Ohio State. So um, uh, it was very active and very successful in the 50s and 60s. What happened in the 60s? Well, there were these changes. P part of this whole business of uh, uh, having the uh, a new College of Biological Sciences and taking departments and moving them from one place to another and those things did happen. So what was the department like in Columbus? Well, we, we had good uh, extension guys, Blair Jansen and Bob Partica. Um, they had a secretary, they had an ongoing program. The rest of the department, there was me and Alan Troxel. That's it. We, we, we had a full-time secretary. <laughs> uh, what, what happened to C.C. Allison? C.C. Allison went to Brazil on an international program, and so he had been in Brazil two or three years. What about Wayne Ellett? Wayne Ellett, you know, no one went to Wayne and said, we need you in this department. So Wayne went with the other college. He went with the College of Biological Sciences. And uh, so it was me and then Alan. <laughs> and uh, you, you know, I loved Alan Troxel, uh, a, a wonderful, wonderful person. Uh, but he wasn't interested in doing a, a lot of things. He, he certainly wasn't interested in research, but, but whatever. But anyway, that's what we had. <laughs> now we, we did have the FTE. What's that? Full-time equivalents. We did have the FTE for a position. Glenn Smith had decided to go back to West Virginia. So we had a position open for uh, July 1, 1968. You know, I went there in, in uh, uh, January 1, 1968, but uh, Kurt Laban had been uh, acting chairman for six months. But anyway, we, we had an open position, and um, uh, we hired Mike Garraway, and, um, you know, uh, oh, a wonderful guy. July 1, December 1, now we had the FTE for Mike. December 1, 
the dean let us add a position without the FTE. In other words, they just gave us the position. We hired Phil Larson. In, um, I think it was January 1970, the dean gave us FTE for a position. We hired Mac Riedel. Uh, a little later that year, the dean gave us FTE for a position, and we hired Chuck Powell. Now, uh, Chuck was an extension guy, but the other three guys, uh, uh, Mike Garraway, Phil Larson, Mac Riedel, uh, they were researchers and teachers, and, and they were the ones, I worked with them, but they were the ones that developed a new curriculum, new courses, and this sort of thing. So uh, they, they, the, the department was on its way. Uh, I would like to show those two pictures uh, just to see what these people look like. And uh, <laughs> see, I'm not sure how I, how, how do I? Yeah, uh, this one, okay. Oh, oh the, uh, now we're in 1982. Oh, Monica, <laughs> it's too early. <laughs> yeah, here we go. Now, this is, this is 1975. 1975, uh, L.J. Uh, uh, Alexander had, had already gone someplace, but these are the uh, faculty, and most of these were there uh, at Worcester. This is at Worcester. Most of the faculty were there in uh, uh, 1968 when I came. Lansing Williams, Lansing Williams, and uh, Randy's talked about him, a wonderful, wonderful person. Uh, the obvious choice for first associate chairman in the department. Uh, I worked with Lansing for 16 years. He, w he went on and stayed as associate chairman for a few more years, but uh, the main thing is we really uh, worked uh, together so well, and uh, we both made decisions. It wasn't, and, and uh, I, I can't think of any single time when uh, Lansing and I uh, disagreed with anything. He was just a wonderful, wonderful person to work with. I, I noticed uh, Lance and Lisa and Patricia and Steve were on the uh, list, but I, I haven't seen them. I don't, uh, maybe they didn't make it here today. But anyway, um, maybe they'll be there uh, tomorrow. But Lansing Williams, uh, Kurt Laban was there in 68, uh, uh, Ray Louie, Don Gordon, Len Herr, Harry Hoytink, Oscar Bradfeud, he was the electron microscope guy, but he was a member of our department, and uh, uh, Fritz Schmidhenner. You know, Fritz and Lansing and I got together a lot of times when I would be there. So those, those are the guys who were there. Now, uh, Roy Gingery, it's nice to see Roy here today. Uh, he, he came to the department in 68, so he came shortly after I got there. And of course we have Randy Rowe, 1974, and uh, Bob Partica, 1974. Now Partica did leave us and went to uh, Oregon, and uh, he's either retired out there or he's still working, I'm not sure. But Randy, of course, um, became the state on and became the third uh, chairman in the department. Okay, let's look at the next picture. <laughs> now the next picture is 1982. 1982 we have uh, uh, basically all those people that uh, I identified before. Uh, but I wanna point out the people that we hired first Mike Garraway, the big smile, a wonderful person. Uh, Mike was on the faculty for 30 years. He uh, uh, retired and unfortunately he was ill and he passed away in 1999. 
Now, I mention this because uh, my wife, Elsie, passed away in 1994. Uh, Marie and I had known each other for many years. Uh, we got married in, in 2004. So anyway, we're, we're an old married couple, but this is, <laughs> this, this is why she's Garraway instead of uh, Deep, because she was Garraway for 33 years, and her kids are Garraway. And uh, uh, anyway. <laughs> okay, so, so Mike came, he was the first. Phil Larson, big, handsome guy, outstanding plant pathologist. Phil, uh, this is 1982. In 84, Phil went to the University of Minnesota as chairman of the department. So we had his position to fill later on. But uh, uh, Mac Riedel, a nematologist, a wonderful, wonderful teacher. And uh, I mentioned Chuck Powell. He was primarily uh, extension. I should mention Lanny Rhodes came in 76. Lanny came to replace Alan Troxell. And uh, Lanny did a wonderful, wonderful job, uh, particularly with the uh, beginning program. And of course, uh, we have a couple of uh, faculty members. You should know this guy, Mike Ellis. Looks young there, doesn't he? <laughs> a few years back. And, uh, Mike is here in 82, and Pat Lips, and, and of course, this guy here, this young guy, 1980, we hired him. And, um, you, you know, I have to say a little bit about Larry. We did not have the FTE to hire Larry, but we were able to bring him in on another kind of program. But he wasn't there very long before all of us on, uh, in the department felt we need a, a solid program for Larry. Uh, uh, tenure uh, earning position. The main thing was the associate director at Worcester, who the associate director is the boss at Worcester. He wanted Larry, and he gave us the FTE. In other words, that was another, another free position that we got. In this case, I'd have to say it was just because of uh, the things that Larry did. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's it on, on the, the what now? Dave, oh, uh, thank you, Monica. I should, I should mention Dave Coughlin. Because I didn't mention Dave on that other picture. He was in the other picture. Uh, but why was he in that other picture? That was the OARDC faculty. Dave came to us at OARDC. <laughs> and it wasn't until many years later that, uh, uh, you know, I always thought the, Dave's position was better off interacting with other people here on the campus. And it did work out so that he did get transferred down here. So thank you for mentioning that one. Uh, I hope I didn't mention any, uh, miss anyone else there. But uh, you know, let, let me let me say uh, uh, three more quick things. Uh, the professor, the uh, professorship uh, in uh, plant protection. There's a story there, and some of this is in the history book. Uh, Larry Madden is our current professor in the professorship. Uh, I held that at one time. The, uh, the uh, two other things I wanted to mention. One of, us, one of them is about the Department of Societal Issues, Pesticides, Genetic Engineering, Environment. That course is still being taught by Monica. And I'm, I just want to say I'm very happy that that course is still being taught. I'm responsible for that course. I had the idea. I wrote the proposal. We got the, uh, uh, the course. That was the easy part. The d difficult part was teaching it because they give you the course, but they don't give you any faculty to teach the course. 
you've got to find that in the department. And uh, uh, I taught the course, but the only way I was able to teach the course was through the help of uh, uh, Chuck Curtis, Terry Graham, and um, uh, Craig Widensall. Those three guys, they worked with me, we taught the course. But I think the, uh, uh, the, the real important thing about this is the course is still alive. It's an important course, not because of plant pathology, not because we're teaching that much plant pathology, it's because it adds credit hours taught uh, to the department. That means you have more funds from the university for teaching if you teach more students. Credit hours taught, numbers of students time the uh, uh, credit hours. And, um, and anyway, that part was successful. One last thing I want to say, and, and that is in regard to uh, Enrico Bonello. Now, you raise your hand there. See, uh, all the faculty know Enrico. Now, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't know why I'm ending this by saying this. Uh, all of, uh, whenever you retire from the department, you have a wish. In this case, I had two wishes. One was that my FTE will be used to hire someone. Okay, uh, doesn't that always happen? No, it doesn't always happen. Someone at the university or someone in the college office decides we need that money someplace else uh, and your FTE just disappears. And so you retired, that was the end of it. Well, uh, I may, I'm not completely sure, Enrico, that this is true, but I think my FTE was used to hire you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah. Okay, then, now, the, now the one last thing, the, the one last thing I'd like to say with regard to Enrico. See, I loved it when we hired him. The other thing that I had hoped for uh, when I retired was that when my FTE is filled, I hope they get someone who adds something to the department, not just to replace me. Uh, there are a lot of people in the department who can replace me. You know, I do the same things that a lot of other people do. Let's get someone who does add something to the department. Well, my, my uh, readings and my uh, spies tell me Enrico has added things to the department. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Can't top that. <laughs> well, uh, just a few, uh, few final things, few announcements, a few thank yous. First of all, uh, announcements, uh, door prizes. Look at your programs on the table. There's a sticker on one of the programs on each table, the back. One, one sticker. If you got the sticker, you can take the flower arrangement from your table. And if you did not get the sticker, you could work with the person with the sticker if you think you would rather have the, the flower. Uh, no violence, please. Okay. Balloons. Any children here can take balloons, work with Sarah on that. There's not that many children. We have more balloons, so others who would like balloons, we're, we'll work that out once we start breaking up. Sarah will work with you on that. I already mentioned T-shirts and other items. The Graduate Student Association are selling those for their programs, not for departmental programs. If you haven't bought a shirt or a uh, glass, a pint glass, you can still do that on the way out. If you haven't gotten your book autographed, you can still do that on the way out. Those of you on this campus, if, you, if you're coming from you know, elsewhere and you would like a tour, a brief tour of Cotman Hall, we, we can do that afterwards. Probably at this point, meeting at the uh, lobby of Cotman Hall at 3.30, since it's about seven after th uh, three right now. So 
some of you may want to see what Cotman's like. There was a major renovation in Cotman just a, a few years ago, and it, and it has improved tremendously. I know several of you I will see tomorrow at our lunch in, in Sylvia Hall in Worcester. Turn to thank yous. I primarily want to thank the organizing committee for this event. It was chaired by our clinical faculty member. What has changed in the university, besides some of the things I mentioned before, is that we have non-tenure track faculty positions as well as tenure track, so a position called clinical or professional practice, primarily responsibility for teaching and academic programs. And Monica Lewandowski, hiding right here, is the first uh, member of our department with that, with that title. She, she, Mo Mo Monica chaired the committee to organize this and did an outstanding job. Many other members of the department were also on the organizing committee. Um, one, I'll have come up here to, to say a final comment here in a minute, but Ramona Powell, um, Ramona's here, Mike Ellis, you can stand up if you're, the other committee members, Mike, where are you? Stand up, uh, stand up while I mention your names, Tom Mitchell, Sarah, Sarah, Sarah Williams, she's standing in the back there waving. Uh, Lee Wilson, you'll see Lee tomorrow. Our grad student, Carsi Mills, is, oh, there she is, right? And I was on the, the committee as well, but I did a lot less work compared to some of these individuals in the preparation. We also want to thank university libraries who helped a lot in finding historical information and the university archives with a lot of work, it came up with a lot of interesting photos and other pieces of information. With that, one member of the search, or search committee, one member of the organizing committee, <laughs> since we're talking about faculty hires so much, uh, um, organizing committee, Ramona Powell, is the one person in the department that is the longest serving member of our department right now at 39 years in the department. <laughs> Come on up here, Ramona. Um, 39 years. <laughs> Ramona would like to make, make an announcement as well, and I think that will be the last part of the program, unless I forgot something else. Yes. What, what did I else did I forget? Oh, no, she does that. No. Okay. <laughs> Ramona. <laughs> and you're bringing uh, company, which is excellent. You can, you, can, you have to stand very close to it. Okay. Well, hi, everybody. Thank you for coming today. Um, 50 is a really big number for a lot of reasons, but there are actually bigger numbers, such as 90. Um, Dr. Deeb, our very first chair, um, will turn 90 on July 23rd, and um, <laughs> we would like us, all of us to sing happy birthday to him. Uh, Gene Kaiser, he hired both Gene Kaiser and I about 40 years ago um, when we were in the B&Z building. And uh, Jean has a lovely voice and sings solos, and she would like to lead us in singing happy birthday to Dr. Deep, okay? <laughs> oh, and Dr. Deep, we have this lovely cake for you to take with you. <laughs> yes. You ready? Yes. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Iron Happy birthday to you. It's harder to see you after eating all of that food. Use the microphone. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Well, um, like like uh, Dr. Madden said, you know, we have a tour of Cotman Hall if you would like to have it. We still have this set of keys here that I don't think belonged to most of you that came later, but it might be you people that are filming. But we do have a set of keys, and the building will lock at four, so if they're your keys, you really you need to come and get them now. <laughs> so, but anyways, thank you all for coming. We had a wonderful time planning. Oh, you want to sing? Oh, okay. Sorry. Thank you. That's Sorry. okay. There's always one more thing. Yes. Um, there's a commemorative 50th anniversary quilt that we would like for everyone to sign. And uh, Sarah, I think, is moving the quilt out into the, into the area where, you're, where you will walk out. 
Please, if you haven't already signed it, who hasn't signed it? Okay, all of you, grab a Sharpie and sign it before you leave. Thank you. Well,